Good evening and welcome to Hamilton Road. It's wonderful to have you with us, uh, those of you who are here in the building. I, I can hear a little bit more relaxed conversation week by week. It's like people are getting used to coming back into the building and that's, that's lovely. Uh, it's lovely to have you here with us this evening. Lovely also to have those who are watching from home, either live this evening or, or sometime later in the week. Wasn't that a beautiful day? Just glorious, and it's been, been nice for a few days. I'm the kind of person who really enjoys that. I, I notice at what's going on in the, the world around me and the, the beauty of nature, so I get a lot from that. So very grateful to God for these beautiful spring days. So it was beautiful out there, but it's beautiful in here too. I'd forgotten what Hamilton Road is like on a sunny evening with these beautiful windows letting in so much light. What a beautiful place this is. It brings back memories for me of many evenings just like this. So it's a privilege with us, or a privilege for us on the end of a a beautiful day like this to gather and to worship God. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh, they sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Shall we do that? Shall we stand together and sing his praise? How lovely is your dwelling place. Psalm 84, let's sing it together.
please take a seat. And please join with me as we pray together. Let's pray. Loving Lord God, how lovely is your dwelling place. Lord, it's lovely to be here tonight in this place, in this building so rich with a heritage of your people. For decades and more than a century, your praises have been sung. Prayers have been raised. Your word has been heard. Lord, it's lovely to be in this place. Lord, it's lovely to be here this evening with these friends, our brothers and sisters in the family you have given us in this place. Lord, it's lovely to be here this evening before you, our Father, enjoying your presence. Lord, much as we enjoy this place, we know that it's not finally your dwelling place. The whole earth is yours. The, the world too small to contain you. As the psalmist reminds us, where could we go to flee from your presence. Father, we thank you this evening for Jesus, the one who is finally the place where we truly meet with you. Lord, we remember him as he, he stood before the temple and he said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it again. Lord, he was talking not about the building before them, but about his body. Jesus knew, he understood that he was the place, the only place where sinful people can meet with a perfect God. Thank you for Jesus, our great high priest, offering the sacrifice for our sins. Thank you for Jesus, the Lamb of God, himself the sacrifice for our sins. Thank you that Jesus both gave and made atonement so that we can come now into the holy place that we really can be with the living God. Lord, how lovely is your dwelling place. Lord, forgive us for taking your presence for granted. Forgive us for those times when we actually would rather escape you and your presence and live away from you. Help us rather to say like the psalmist, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. Lord, it's lovely for us to be here with you this evening. Amen. This evening we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, we're not going to read a Bible passage and then reflect on it as we normally do. I'm going to read a psalm in a few moments' time. But rather, rather than reading a, a passage and preaching on it, which is our norm here in Hamilton Road, I'm going to invite you to come to a part of God's Word uh, maybe in a, a way that's new for you this evening. So we might say that rather than preaching this evening, I'm going to be teaching about a, a part of the Bible. I'm going to be teaching on prayer, and I'm going to be teaching on spiritual formation. Now, just before anyone storms out of the building or, or switches off their YouTube, let me point out that I'm in good company here. Jesus taught spiritual formation. He taught his disciples how to live their life before God. So whenever his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, he didn't on that occasion 
look in his briefcase for sermon notes about a sermon on prayer. Instead, he taught them how to pray. He showed them what to do. He said, when you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. This evening, I'd love us to be in a similar place to those disciples. We're still asking, well, I know I am. Maybe you're not. Maybe you've cracked this. Maybe you're praying easily, happily, and well. But a lot of us are still saying, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus, we love the prayer that you gave your first disciples. We repeat it in our services. We pray other prayers that are based on it. Thank you for that prayer. But truth be told, we still find prayer difficult. We'd still be glad of your help. Lord, teach us to pray. If we had Jesus with us this evening and were able to ask him that question in the same way that the disciples did, I can't say for sure what his answer would be. But I expect that if we had a conversation with Jesus about prayer and about how we should pray, it wouldn't be long in the conversation before he encouraged us to pray the Psalms. Let me, let me tell you why I think that's the case. Jesus was the most Psalm-soaked person who ever lived. Throughout his life, he was always living and praying the Psalms. If I had time, I'd show you verse after verse after verse in the Gospels to demonstrate what I mean. But I'm going to limit for a couple of minutes a focus on, on, on the Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' life. So, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey. Uh, We know that Palm Sunday, we celebrated it a few weeks ago. The Jewish crowds, as they welcome him, sing a psalm. Psalm 118. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A few days later, Jesus is eating with his disciples, the Passover meal, and Matthew tells us, chapter 26, when they had sung a hymn, they set out to the Mount of Olives. Now, what hymn did they sing? It wasn't in Christ alone, was it? It wasn't any hymn that you and I know, other than they're singing from the hymn book of God's people, from the Psalms. Most scholars agree that they were probably singing the customary hymn for celebrating Passover. Psalms 113 through to 118, the Hallel, So in this last evening that he spends with his disciples before his betrayal, his arrest, his crucifixion, Jesus is singing psalms with his friends. While he's hanging on the cross, when Jesus is speaking his last words before his life is snuffed out, It's psalms that are on his lips. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's amazing. He's reciting psalms. And with his dying breath, Jesus cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I didn't know that was a psalm. Psalm 31. And it's the richer when you read it in the whole psalm. We realize, or I realize in a new way, what he's actually saying. He's not, it's not a cry of despair or a cry of defeat. Psalm 31 reads, Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, my faithful God. It's not despair and defeat. It's, here's my body. I know you've got me. I know you've redeemed me. I know you'll raise me. That's what I'm praying with my very last words. So just a couple of moments there, we've we've noticed how much the Psalms saturate 
the life of Jesus. Jesus is being sustained and strengthened in his last days and hours by the Psalms. This is what I mean when I say that he lived a Psalm-saturated life. But it's not only true to say that, that Jesus is saturated with the Psalms. It's also true to say that the Psalms are saturated with Jesus. If you know them, you, you may know this. After Jesus uh, had been raised by his father from the dead, uh, and as he's traveling on the road to Emmaus, what, what does it Luke tells us about that conversation? Jesus is teaching his disciples everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus is saturated with the Psalms and the Psalms are saturated with Jesus. Folks, since Jesus was so committed to praying the Psalms, it was the most natural thing in the world that his followers would, would follow suit, that they'd be like him in this regard. And that's why when it comes to Pentecost, when Peter's preaching before the crowd, guess what? First sermon in the new church, he's using two Psalms, Psalm 16 and Psalm 110 as two of his texts. After Peter's sermon, we read that 3,000 people were added to the church. And in the very next verse, we read this very famous verse. Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and properly translated, to the prayers. Not, not to prayer in a general kind of a way. The prayers. The prayers of the early church are the Psalms. The prayer book of God's people. The New Testament church, like Jesus, were devoted to praying the Psalms. I'm reading a, a book at, about the Psalms at the moment. It's called Open and Unafraid by a gentleman called David Taylor. David was a fellow student with me at Regent College in the 1990s. Um, in this book, he tells of a course that he took at Regent with Eugene Peterson, the pastor and the author. The, the course was entitled Biblical Spirituality. In the book, he, he describes what a glorious experience that was, what wonderful insights he gained on the course. But then he, he describes a moment and a conversation. The moment was at the end of this semester, at the end of this class, at the end of the last three-hour session and says, Taylor, it dawned on me that Peterson had no intention of giving us any practical help to enact his vision of biblical spirituality. So I raised my hand. Dr. Peterson, I said, this has been a very rich experience. Thank you. I have no idea, however, what to do with it. Could you help us? Could you tell us one thing that we could do, practically speaking, with this scriptural vision that you've presented to us? In his book, Taylor describes what happens next. After thinking for a longish moment, Peterson answered in his characteristically quiet, gravelly voice. His answer, I felt, was deceptively simple. He said... Tomorrow, David, read Psalm 1. The next day, read Psalm 2. The day after that, read Psalm 3. When you get to the end, start over. Thank you and good night. Peterson had been asked how we're to live this life, how we're to pray wisely and well. And on that occasion, his advice was, start reading and praying the Psalms. Jesus read the Psalms. The early church read and prayed the Psalms. 
Eugene Peterson prayed the Psalms. He invited David Taylor to pray the Psalms. I've been reading and praying the Psalms for about a year and a half now. Claire got me into it. It's her fault. She started the addiction. She'd been reading about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and about his Psalm reading. And as I started reading the Psalms and reading about reading the Psalms, I realized that a great variety of people throughout church history have loved to, to do this, to read the Psalms. From St. Augustine to Johann Sebastian Bach, from John Calvin to the Methodist, C.S. Lewis to Charles Spurgeon, we have American presidents who were Psalm readers. We have modern filmmakers, Peter Weir of The Truman Show and Clint Eastwood. Actually, the truth is, most of the church throughout its history read the Psalms. So the Psalm readers aren't the lunatic fringe. We're the ones who've been left behind. This evening, I'd like to invite you to join me in reading and praying the Psalms. To follow in the footsteps of the Psalm-saturated Jesus and to read the Psalms that are saturated with Jesus. We're going to pause the teaching for a moment here, and I'm going to do what I said I would do a moment ago. I'm going to read a Psalm for you. Feel free to read along with me. We'll read Psalm 130. I'll tell you now that in a moment we're going to sing it as well, but I'll maybe say a word or two about that before we come to do it. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. In his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen. This is the word of God. Just now we're going to sing this song at a lovely moment this morning. Sometimes this happens to you where you've planned something and then somebody says to you, you know, I wish we would do this more in the church. So somebody said to me this morning before the service, we don't sing the metrical psalms anymore. And I said to myself, well, just wait and see what we've got planned for this evening. We're going to sing Psalm 130. Part of it is going to be the, the metrical psalm. Some of you will know this. This will be, this will stir old memories for you to sing psalms in this way. Some of you, it'll be quite new to you, but the beauty of the metrical psalms is that the, the writers of the, the, those who have rewritten the, the biblical text have written it in such a way that it fits very easily with a chosen tune. So you should find it easy to join in. So we're going to sing some metrical parts of Psalm 130, but we're also going to sing some new uh, verses written uh, based on Psalm 130 by Keith and Kristen Getty. So let's stand together and start to do this thing that we're talking about, taking the, the words of the Psalter, praying them, singing them, offering them to the Lord. I will wait for you.
Please take a seat. How did that happen? How did we get all the good singers booked in in one night? That was brilliant. Wasn't that good fun? To sing a metrical psalm and a brand new song. And so wonderfully in tune with the heart. And wonderfully prayerful before God. I thought one of the, the best ways to invite you to consider reading and praying the Psalms uh, with me is to invite you to listen in on a conversation uh, among a few enthusiasts. So I'm just about to show you a video where three uh, gentlemen have a, a, a quick chat about their love for the Psalms. Two of the gentlemen I've already mentioned uh, this evening, so Eugene Peterson, uh, my professor at Regent College, David Taylor, uh, the student who put up his hand in that class and asked the question and got that answer about pray 
Psalm 1 tomorrow, pray Psalm 2 the next day, pray Psalm 3 the day after that. Well, in 2015, about 20 years after they had that conversation, David Taylor had an idea to uh, bring a friend of Eugene Peterson to visit him at his home in Montana uh, to get the two of them talking about the Psalms. So the video which we're about to watch, it begins, it, it starts earlier than we're going to start. It has about five or six minutes before that, which tells of an unlikely friendship between Eugene Peterson and Bono, the lead singer from the rock group U2. If you're interested to learn more about how the two became friends, you need to watch the first part of the video. We don't have time to watch that this evening. So we pick up this story as Bono is taken out of U2's North American tour and is delivered to Eugene and Jan Peterson's home in Lakeside in Montana. This video lasts about 14 minutes. I realized when I came in this evening and saw how bright the building was, I saw the, the problem with my cunning plan. Okay, it might not look brilliant on the screen. Please be patient with me. Please uh, take what you can from it. If, if you can't make anything at all of it, then I'll uh, give you an idea of what they've been talking about at the end. But let's listen in as these gentlemen share a little bit of their love for the Psalms. I think it's one of his one of his best ones. And he he sings it a lot. I mean he does this a lot. It's one of the psalms that reaches into the hurt and disappointment and uh, difficulty of being a human being. And uh, acknowledges that in, in a language that is immediately um, recognizable. You know, there's something that reaches into the heart of a person and the stuff we all feel many of us don't talk about. I waited and waited and waited for God. At last, he looked, finally he listened. And he lifted me out of the ditch. He pulled me from deep mud. He stood me up on a solid rock to make sure that I wouldn't slip. He taught me how to sing the latest God song. We're at Eugene and Jan Peterson's home. Bono is coming here, flying here from Vancouver, in order to meet, be together connect as friends, but also have a conversation about the Psalms in order to share this common love for the Psalm and bear witness to others of the beauty and power of the Psalms. Cookies are just about done. Look at this. It's so yeah. good to have you here. Great to see you. Oh, God bless you. Well, God's blessed you, that's for sure. <laughs> Look where you live. <laughs> this is quite a spot. You know, I just realized, never been to Montana. Haven't you really? So many gifts already, <laughs> just, just, just since being here. And welcome to the Flathead. That's what I always like to say to people when they come. What is your earliest memory of the Psalms? And what sort of impression 
did it have on you both? I was 12 years old when I discovered the Psalms. I picked up the Bible and I started reading. And somebody told me that the Psalms were important, so I started with the Psalms. And I was totally confused. Um, Because I grew up in a culture where every word in the Bible was the word of God, literally. Don't mess around with it. It's just, that's the way it is. And I was starting to read uh, that he keeps my tears in his bottle, uh, shields, (laughs) uh, javelins, a rock. God is a rock. Come on. And um, after about two or three weeks of this, I just was just confused. And I thought, I'm missing something. And uh, I'd never heard the word metaphor before, but I learned what a metaphor was, not by knowing the name, but by just observing what's going on in the Psalms. So I think the Psalms are important because they, for some people like me at 12 years old, they showed me that imagination was, um, was a way to get inside the truth. I remember the Psalms from the little Church of Ireland church. Um, and so I'm, as a child going, I remember thinking great words, shame about the tunes. Uh, <laughs> except for the Lord is my shepherd, which was a great tune. And I really like that. This is good. Words and melodies. Ah, they have this rawness, the brutal honesty of whether it's David or not, it doesn't matter. The psalmist is brutally honest about the explosive joy um, that he's feeling and the deep sorrow or confusion. And it's that that makes, that sets the psalms apart for me. And, and I often think, gosh, well, why isn't church music more like that? The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. Is that right? It's beautiful. It was right. Oh boy, this is magic. Wow, he went, how, when did you get the place? When did you get this place? Oh, it's been in the family. My father bought, brought the, bought the property just towards the end of the Second World War, 1945, 46. So then we expanded, we doubled the size of this because we knew we'd, we'd have a lot of guests. We knew we'd have you. <laughs> Foolishly made room for the Irish. I got started with this, uh, translating the Psalms by translating a Psalm for a c- c- certain person, just a single person, um, to try to get them to realize that praying wasn't being nice before God. I would translate a Psalm that I thought fit them. And you know, the Psalms are not pretty. They're not, they're not nice. And, um, And I would ask them, just pray this psalm using my translation. I think I'm doing it about as close to the Hebrew as I can get it. But it's it's not smooth. It's not nice. It's not pretty. But it's it's honest. And I think we're trying for honesty, um, which is very, very hard in our our culture. I'm talking about dishonesty. That I find a lot of in, the, in in Christian art, a lot of dishonesty. Yeah, right. and, I, and, and, and I think it's a shame because you got these are people who are vulnerable to God, in a good way. You know, vulnerable. I mean, porous, open. I I would love if 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 this conversation would inspire people who are writing these beautiful voices and writing these beautiful, say, gospel songs, write a song about their bad marriage. Write a song about, about how they're, you know, pissed off at the government. Because that's what God wants from you, that truth, the way, the truth. And, and that truthfulness, know the truth, the truth will set you free. It'll blow things apart. Why I, I'm suspicious of Christians, 
is because uh, of this lack of realism. And I'd love to see more of that in art and in life and in music. The Psalms have an honest quality to the, the feeling that is expressed. The psalmist is saying, I'm mad about this, I'm happy about that, I'm confused about this, I'm despairing about that. What is the work of the artist in the making of the work to acknowledge the intensity, the reality of the feeling without indulging the feeling? Self-indulgent? What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'm an opera singer and so I let those feelings go through me and come out. Uh, having feelings is perfectly normal. And, and let them out. Why do I like the Psalms? David, I like David very much. Why? He danced naked in front of the troops. That's one reason I like him. <laughs> and his missus was not at all happy. You know, it's, it's this abandonment, you know, that, that you've, got to, you've got to get it out. It's important. And dancing, very important and understanding our, our bodies as well as our minds and our spirits. And the three-personed God, the Trinity, is reflected in our, our body, mind, spirit. And we have to we ignore, we really do ignore this. What do we do with violence? violence in our own hearts, the sense of wanting to do violence and the violence in the world? That's a hard question. We need to find a way to cuss without cussing. And the imprecatory psalms surely do that. They just lay it out. And uh, I just, I think they're really important. If we've got to have some way in context, and the context is the whole Bible and the whole Psalter, some way in context to tell people how, um, how mad we are. So one of Eugene's uh, translations, uh, ooh, 35, punch the nose, punch the nose, is that 35? <laughs> it's fantastic. And uh, punch the nose of the bullies, God. Um, but I love the idea of you've got to cuss, find a way of cussing without cussing, and you have to give vent to that. I like that. that. That's going to stay with me. Do you have songs that have given some kind of expression, narrative, poetic, to violence, to this yes. violence in us, violence in the world? Yes. And it's called Raised by Wolves, the song. And I try to make it real. Try to bring people to that place, because it must have had an effect on me, and I want to understand violence. Um, a bombing that I missed in Dublin myself. Um, three car bombs, time to go off at 5.30 on a Friday night in 1974. Any other time I would have been on the street where the bomb went off because I used to travel through the city centre from going get two buses home from school. And But there was a bus strike that day and I took a bicycle. And I have no problem with the Old Testament. I don't see God as a violent God, but I think the world is a violent place, and it does reflect that. And, and it, it's a terrifying thing, some, to some of the Old Testament, but, but, but it is real. And in a way, I kind of prefer it to the airy-fairy mm. stuff where we don't get, re you know, we don't, where, we, where we don't get real. Is there a way to read the Psalms through Jesus' eyes that helps us understand Violence or non-violence? Well, yeah, the crucifixion. When there's violence, there's got to be some kind of response. And is it more violence or less? I'm glad we have a crosses in every room in this house, but I, when I look at those, I think, I don't think of decoration. I think of this is the world we live in, and it's a world with a lot of crosses. And I just would like to spend my life um, doing something about that through scripture, through preaching, through friendship. Uh, and now my, you know, my ears are, ears are getting shorter and uh, don't have nearly as many left. But I, I don't want to escape the, escape the violence.
I hope you were able to follow most of what was going on in that video. Um, I, I showed the video not, not to teach theology. I, I, just as I was listening there, I, I, I realized why Bono isn't my go-to theological reference point. Um, not everything he said uh, I would necessarily agree with. I, I showed you these three men in conversation to to share the, the passion that they have for years of immersing themselves in the Psalms, being people who pray the, the Psalms and live the Psalms. I'm gonna speak for a few more moments. Um, really what I've been trying to do here this evening uh, in introducing you to the, this idea of, of reading and praying the Psalms. I want, to, I want to call what I'm doing here honest to God. It might turn into a wee series. Um, I, I'd love to talk about some particular things that, that are going on in the Psalms. Um, I think it's a, I, I deliberately stuck with that title. When it came to me, I thought, oh, that, that sounds difficult, that title. Um, it, it sounds difficult for a couple of different reasons. One is when you hear it said in Northern Ireland, it, it's, it's almost a way of swearing, isn't it? I swear, honest to God. So it, it has a, an almost a, a blasphemous edge to it. That, that's not what I have in mind. It's, it's uncomfortable when we think of it in those terms. What I have in mind when I use that title is just the straightforward title. And it's an invitation to consider our lives and to ask ourselves, are we honest before God? That's what I find myself wondering and asking myself as I've been praying the Psalms. Do you find it easy to be truthful in prayer? It seems to me that this second way of thinking of the phrase is, is equally and maybe more disturbing than the first. Many of us struggle to be honest with God. If, if anybody ever taught us to pray at all, it's likely that they taught us to pray polite prayers. This is how you pray. This is the kind of thing that we should say to God. And what ends up happening is that we don't pray what's inside us. We're not honest to God. Peterson, and you maybe picked it up in the, the wee video there, he, he recognizes this. He says, honesty is, of course, very hard to come by in our culture. But I learned how to pray honestly by translating the Psalms for what became the Message Bible. What we find in the Psalms is a gritty, no-nonsense honesty, which is why the Psalms aren't pretty. They're not nice, but they are honest. I thought I'd spend just a couple of moments sharing with you my experience of, of doing this for just over a year now. I've been praying one psalm per day for 16 months or so. It wasn't very long after I started reading that we were plunged into the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I, I don't know if you remember how unsettling that moment was when we were all locked into our houses and all our systems shut down, all our routines were taken from us. That was a, a very unsettling time for a lot of us. The Lord brought me a psalm for those very early days of the lockdown, Psalm 57. Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I'll take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Could have been written for the moment. Psalm 61 was another one that really spoke to me in those early days. In verse two of that psalm, the psalmist cries out, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. Actually, that probably summarizes for me how I felt about the psalms this last year or so. I think it's a wonderful metaphor for what Sam Prang's been doing for me. It, it takes me out of myself to something bigger. Um, 
myself and my problems in this relationship are small before the rock that's bigger than I am. Praying these psalms keeps God big in my heart and my imagination in my day and, and somehow keeps my stuff in the right perspective. What else can I say about reading the psalms? If, if you do this, what you'll find is that there's a lot of darkness in there. Maybe like me, you'll find more empathy for the darkness you feel than you've ever found in the church or among Christian friends. Sometimes in church, there is just a pressure to put a brave face on things, to keep going no matter what. The Psalms allow us to express heartache and anger. I think if I keep praying the Psalms, I, I think it's probably already happened, but I'd love it to happen more. I think it's gonna help me to be more honest, more emotionally honest before God. The Psalms have helped me as well. If you know the Psalms, you might know this. They've helped me recognize a truth that I, I think I'd probably tried to suppress. I'm, I'm generally a very patient and tolerant person, so I thought I had no enemies. Maybe you're like that too. If you read the Psalms, about a third of them are about your enemies and what you, what you think of them and what you want God to do to them. So when I first read them, I thought, I, I don't get this. Why is he talking about having enemies? And then after a while, stuff started to come up. People who had hurt me. People with whom I was angry. And reading God's word and praying this was starting to starting to allow me to be honest to God. I found myself able to, to tell God about my enemies and it felt safe, there, it felt like there was a way to do that. Maybe that's a sign that I'm, I'm learning, I'm starting to, to be more honest with God. Overall, I'd say that my experience of God's presence uh, with me through the day, so I read these Psalms usually in the morning time and I find they're just a wonderful way to, to recognize God's presence early in the day. And, and I've I found myself able to enjoy God's presence further into the day. I've, I've been astonished. You know, don't get me wrong. Some mornings you, you lift the, the Psalms, you read it, and you go, goodness, what's that got to do with me? Sometimes that's just my experience, and that, that's Okay. But many, many, many times I read it and I think, goodness, those words, I couldn't have written those myself, but they express exactly how I'm feeling. Martin Luther talks about this. His descriptions, his description of the Psalms, it speaks of, of my experience. He says, the Psalter is the book of all saints and everyone in whatever situation he may be finds in that situation psalms and words that fit his case that suit him as if they were put there just for his sake so that he could not put it better himself or find or wish for anything better that's what i found i found the psalmist expresses what's inside me better than i do and i love that because i hope i learn to express myself and be more honest to god Folks, I think, I haven't, I haven't decided for sure, but I think I might uh, have a wee series where maybe every month or two uh, I'll do an evening like this on the Psalms. Uh, what I would do then, this, this was more like an introduction, what I might do is look at particular aspects of the Psalms. Uh, this idea that the Psalms are honest or that they're full of sorrow, lament, that they're angry, that they talk a lot about enemies and they talk about God's justice. I'll have a, I'll have a think about that and see if I, I sense the Spirit's invitation to, to go further with that. I need to wrap up for this evening, but I suppose I have a question as I close. Are you ready to start praying a psalm each day? If you've got a prayer life that's going 
brilliantly or a way of reading the Bible that's going brilliantly, please don't let me distract you. This is, this is more for people who are struggling. If, if you're looking for a way in, something you'd like to try, then I'm, I'm asking you, would you fancy reading a psalm? Psalm 1 today, Psalm 2 tomorrow, Psalm 3 the next day, and then when you finish, start over again. It won't be easy. Peterson, uh, in one of his books about the Psalms, he says, prayer is not easy, but the practice of millions of Christians throughout centuries of use is adequate proof that we don't have to acquire expertise in the Psalms before we use them. They themselves are the prayers that train us to pray. Isn't that brilliant? Prayers that train us to pray. What if God gave you the best prayers that he wanted you to pray? Be mad not to use them, wouldn't we? So I'm inviting you to think about praying a psalm each day. By the way, I'll, I'll extend the invitation a little bit further. If you want to join me and read along with me, I'll tell you what day it is in my plan. So you can read along with me and then tell me how frustrating you're finding it or how great or, or whatever. Today, because I started on the 1st of January, I'm on Psalm 115 today, okay? Great Psalm. Talks, uh, we, we pray in Psalm 115. It talks about how stupid idols are. And if you pray it, it, it does a brilliant thing. It, it reorients your heart from some of the idols that might be just grabbing you and reminds you, I'd be daft to be distracted from the living God. That's what I was praying today. Psalm 116 is a great psalm. Some of you might remember, I was here long before I was ever your minister. I was invited a year and a half ago to preach at a harvest service, and I preached a sermon about gratitude. It was from Psalm 116. Great psalm. That's tomorrow's psalm. If you read with me, you'll enjoy it. Psalm 117, now for anyone who's struggling, it's, it's the shortest of all psalms, two verses. So it's a bit of a bonus easy day. Keeps, keeps the momentum going. Uh, think ahead, those of you who know this altar know where this is going. Yeah? Psalm 118 is fine. Psalm 119 is like 22 psalms put together. So you need to take a half day from work to, to get through it. I'm just warning you, it's, it's really the only one that's that long. If, if you really need to, you can jump over and go to 120. If you're reading along with me and want to email me, let me know how you're getting on. I'd love to, love to hear from you. Uh, I'd love to encourage you with that. Let's bring this to a close and, and let's pray together. Let's pray. Lord, there's something very unsettling about this way we've spent our time this evening. Uh, we've been challenged with the idea that our lives with you aren't perhaps entirely honest or, or maybe not as honest as they might be. Lord, we've been shown a, a possibility that we're maybe, we're maybe living with you only out of, out, out of certain rooms in, in the house of our heart. Other rooms are closed to you. Lord, thank you for your grace and your kindness and your love. Thank you for gently inviting us in your word to come to you and to be honest, to talk about our heartache, to talk about our anger, as well as our, our deep joy and our love for you. Lord, I pray that you would provoke us this evening, make us all, every one of us, less willing to be in a dishonest or less than fully honest relationship with you. Call us to something deeper and more real. We pray it all in Jesus' name who was the way, the truth, and the life, the most honest person who ever lived. Amen.
Folks, we're going to finish. Uh, you, I don't know if you noticed, both of our songs were psalms. Uh, our last one's going to be a psalm. I thought, I'd, I thought I'd make it easy. Shall we sing the 23rd psalm? You know the old tune? We'll drop that fancy chorus that somebody wrote 10 years ago. Let's just sing the 23rd psalm, the old way. Uh, Mark, I don't know if we could drop any musical accompaniment for a verse or two just to allow us to hear our voices as we raise them to God. Let's stand and sing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, tonight and evermore. Amen.